Thank you so much to PCRI and the organizers for inviting me to share an update on what we're doing here at City of Hope for immunotherapy. Um, and I will speak more broadly about T cell therapy for prostate cancer. Um, and then I look forward to engaging with Mark Moyad for a Q&A session, which I'm sure will be lively. Um, but the work I'm doing here at City of Hope is really the brainchild of Saul Priceman, who's a brilliant immunologist and a cellular therapy expert, a PhD, and then Steve Foreman, who's been my sort of clinical mentor, uh, a guru in CAR T cell and other cellular therapeutics. So I wanted to acknowledge them right from the get go. These are my disclosures and just a brief summary of what we'll review. We'll look at our PSCA targeted CAR T here at City of Hope, as well as the commercial PSMA targeted CAR T from Poseida. And then some other ways of targeting prostate cancer using the immune system, including bite antibodies and some other immunotherapies. So why should we want to target T cells for cancer therapy? Uh, this schematic shows you a bit about some of the different components of our immune system. And you'll see this one here is called the cytotoxic T cell. And what that means is that's the one that can actually go and kill something. Um, some of our other components like the um, myeloid lineage, they can kill bacteria. Um, but when we're talking about cancer, primarily it's going to be T cells that can kill cancer. So that's why we've chosen them. So what is CAR T cell therapy? It, it's a chimeric antigen receptor. So essentially we are changing the receptor of the T cell. Uh, because right now your T cells want to react to viruses or fungi or various other invaders. And what we want them to do is to attack cancer. Um, so the T cell, when it comes up to anything that it encounters, has to lock in with the receptor. And that's what determines whether it gets active and attacks or not. So in the CAR T cell, what we're doing is we are changing what this is looking for or what it locks with in its receptor so that we can now see cancer with it. In order to do this, we have to start with a person's own T cells. So we do what's called a leukapheresis. It's essentially like donating platelets at the Red Cross. We use a similar machine. Your blood goes in, we pick out the T cells, blood goes back into your body. So it takes a few hours. Then we um, start the process of restructuring and most of us use a virus to insert the gene and replace the receptor gene that exists. And then we have to make hundreds of millions of them. So we incubate them with some stimulants and then we infuse them into people after they've gone through all the quality control. So this whole process can take anywhere from three to eight weeks, depending on uh, the specifics of what we're doing to the CAR T cell and how we're producing them. So again, that looks like a lot of work. Why CAR T cells? Well, this is a brief summary of some of the excitement about CAR T cells. So in leukemia, 93% complete response rate with this uh, drug that's very difficult to pronounce, to Tisangenlaclusil, and then with the other one for lymphoma, axicabtagene, silolucel, curing, again, you know, the majority of patients. And these are patients whose cancer has become resistant to almost everything that's been thrown at it. So very exciting to be able to cure patients. Now, we have a long way to go to take that from leukemia and lymphoma, uh, which exist in the immune kind of channels and the bloodstream, to a solid tumor like prostate cancer. But that's what we're working on. So what are the side effects of CAR T cell therapy? Well, we learned from leukemia that we can see what's called cytokine release. So when T cells are trying to kill something, there's also a lot of other stuff they're producing that creates inflammation. And so patients can have fevers and chills, their blood pressure can drop, they could need oxygen. And so these are often treatments that are administered in a hospital. We can also see later on, a couple weeks later sometimes, some mental status changes like confusion, neurological toxicity. And so we try to keep people near our cancer center for about 30 days after T cells go in, just to make sure 
we're monitoring them for that potential side effect. And then in leukemia, they talk about on-target off-tumor toxicity, but the truth is their target is very, very specific. So about the only other um, normal tissue that has collateral damage is a B cell. So you can get lack of antibody production. So it's a different component of your immune system. Um, but we'll talk about what that looks like for solid tumors based on what we're programming the T cells to look after. But just another little piece of excitement, why CAR T cells? Um, here at City of Hope, uh, our cellular therapy group uh, led by Christine Brown um, and Steve Foreman, and then together with the neurosurgical group, um, have created CAR T cells and then put them directly into the fluid around the brain. And so this was a New England Journal paper um, showing this patient where they were giving these CAR T cells that were going after a glioblastoma target. So, you know, glioblastoma, very, very difficult um, and lethal brain cancer. Um, so they engineered T cells, they put them in the fluid around the brain and they um, got sustained remission out to about 18 months. Um, but you can see they were doing multiple doses and multiple scans, but it was very exciting because this is one of the toughest cancers to treat. So in prostate cancer, of course, um, we are looking at targeting uh, not the brain. So we're going to have to put our T cells into the bloodstream so that they can get to the bone or the lymph node or wherever the prostate cancer is. And we need to figure out what's the best target to help our T cells find the prostate cancer. So we are looking at PSCA, uh, whereas you might be more familiar with PSMA, prostate specific membrane antigen. Um, and this is just a distribution of what tissues in the body have PSMA, normal tissues. Um, so certainly it's mostly restricted to prostate, but there is some expression on some other tissues, which gives potential for side effects when a T cell goes after those. Um, PSCA is uh, strongly expressed in um, the prostate, but also has some expression in the stomach and has some expression in the bladder. When we look at a comparison of PSCA and PSMA on tumor tissue on the right hand side, we can see that the expression on prostate cancer, which is this third red column, uh, is very, very strong, uh, similar to PSMA. PSA is the highest expression. Um, and then when we're looking at other tissues, um, pancreas has PSCA and so does bladder, but PSMA is not expressed in those cancers. So one of the things we like about PSCA is the potential that we could treat not just prostate cancer, but maybe also pancreatic and bladder cancers with the same engineered T cell concept. So when we're looking for PSCA, we do some protein staining that we call immunohistochemistry. So this uh, is a protein that was discovered at UCLA by doctors Ryder and Witte, and they also um, developed the antibodies that help us look for it in cancer tissue. And so they, among others, have shown that it's expressed in the majority of prostate cancers with limited normal tissue expression. Um, and the brown staining is sort of showing us that it's highlighting the prostate cancer and it's not highlighting all the other tissue in the area. So this is a schematic of our phase one first in human clinical trial with PSCA targeted CAR T cells. Um, so we initially screen for PSCA on existing tissue. We don't usually do an extra biopsy unless we really have to. So your prostatectomy that was five years ago or your prostate biopsy, we can use that. We just take a couple slices from the wax block and we stain it for that protein that we're looking for. Um, if a patient meets all the criteria to get into the study, so they have metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, their cancer has become resistant to drugs like abiraterone, which is Zytiga, and zalutamide, which is Xtandi, chemotherapy, such as Taxotere, which is docetaxel, um, you know, multiple different treatments that are known to prolong survival. If they're um, still having resistance, then they can be eligible. Um, and if they pass all the screening, then we go ahead and do the leukapheresis where we collect the T cells. And it takes us about three weeks to produce ours here. Then we do an on-study biopsy, which has been really important and interesting. We do one before and one after 
the CAR T cells so that um, we can see, did the T cells get into the tumor? If so, are they tired? Are they active? Uh, is all the tumor gone? You know, we can learn a lot from these paired biopsy samples. So they're predominantly bone, but we've had some patients with liver or lymph node involvement where we've biopsied those organs. We give some chemotherapy, so a lot of people don't realize that there is a special, what they used to call cytoreductive chemotherapy, um, because we need to create space for our new T cells. We want to sort of get rid of some of the existing T cells and put our engineered T cells in. But what we've learned, and really Dr. Priceman has um, published some fascinating work on this, is that the chemo does something more than that. So we're changing the way we think about it as more of a tumor microenvironment modulating chemotherapy uh, because the cyclophosphamide that we use, uh, which has some anti-prostate cancer effect anyway, published in the literature, um, and the fludarabine together seem to do something that makes the cancer more visible, more accessible to our T cells. So in the animal experiments, Dr. Priceman can cure many more mice with prostate cancer when this chemotherapy is given and the T cells just don't work as well on their own. However, because this was a brand new CAR T, what we decided to do was start with just the T cells and no chemotherapy. It also wasn't clear in solid tumors whether that chemo was really as important when we started this study two years ago. So we just gave 100 million cells to the first three patients without any preparatory chemo. And then we started giving the chemo and 100 million cells with an aim that we were gonna escalate to 300 million and 600 million. Um, what we were hoping might be an effective dose. So I can't give you all the details about what we've seen. We're working on pulling together the data and hopefully we'll be submitting it for publication. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see all the data soon. But what I can say is we've treated 12 patients. We did hit a toxicity which was on target off tumor, uh, which was inflammation of the bladder or what we call cystitis. And uh, so that has limited us. We haven't gotten up to 300 million. We've been sticking at the 100 million and trying to reduce the side effects uh, by changing some things around. And we have seen responses, not just PSAs dropping. We've actually seen some metastases on the CAT scan or the MRI um, shrink or uh, disappear. We've seen on bone scan things get better. So these T cells can work, um, but we are still learning and working out the kinks, so to speak, in the treatment. It's possible we'll need to give multiple doses, unlike leukemia, where you can give it once and the cure happens or doesn't. Um, we may need to add some additional boosters to try to get these like really deep, long-lasting remissions, which is what the hope of the CAR-T therapy is. So why might our T cells struggle once we put them in? Well, they have to get all the way into the tumor, which in prostate cancer is predominantly in the bone. And there can be all kinds of barriers to getting in there. There can be inhibitory substances secreted by the cancer. There are inhibitory components of the immune system that can limit the ability of the T cells to get in and do their job. Um, and you've probably heard something about the immune checkpoints like PD-1 and CTLA-4. So it's possible that those are being engaged by the tumor to try to turn off the T cells. So again, those biopsies that we're doing are really going to help us learn which of these factors um, are coming into play and perhaps limiting the efficacy of the CAR T cells. And that's how we'll learn how to best outsmart the tumor and get uh, even greater efficacy from our CAR T cells. Now, um, Poseida is a company that's creating CAR T cells targeting PSMA, um, and uh, there have been side effects seen with that CAR T cell program too. Um, there was a um, press release, unfortunately, when a patient died from a rare but serious side effect of CAR T cells called macrophage activation syndrome. This is something that has been seen in the other CAR T cells, like for leukemias and lymphoma, so it wasn't a complete unknown, but it was unexpected. Um, and the good news is that although this was a terrible event, it seems to have been an isolated event. The study has been able to reopen. Patients are being treated. I can't tell you much. I'm not <laughs> allowed to share. This is their data, but I can say I'm glad they reopened because 
um, patients can benefit and the side effect is something that we have not um, had as much trouble with in subsequent patients. We're able to um, manage the side effect profile of this particular CAR T. So CAR T cells, very powerful, uh, can have side effects, can be super effective. We still have a long way to go in prostate cancer. Um, what about other ways to engage T cells? Well, it would certainly be great if there was a one size fits all um, that we didn't have to remove from someone's body and program and, and make millions and then put them back in. That's a long process and complicated and expensive, right? So what if we could just engage the T cell without having to do all that? So the BITE antibody or bispecific T cell engaging antibodies seek to accomplish uh, what the CAR T does, but just by sticking in an antibody that essentially has two heads, uh, one that will find a T cell and one that finds the cancer. And so it brings them together, tries to activate the T cell against the cancer. So there is a BITE antibody that's currently FDA approved for leukemia, um, blinatumumab. And so it's, it's a kind of proven concept. Um, and then now that we're moving into prostate cancer, PSMA is a good potential target. Um, so that AMG160 bite antibody targets PSMA and the other head looks for CD3, which is on T cells. Um, unlike CAR T cells, where we are hoping to just give it once and it does its thing uh, because the T cells, once they get into your body can make more of themselves. This is an antibody you put it in at some point, your body gets rid of it. So it needs to be given on an ongoing basis. And this one's dosed every two weeks. AMG509 is another bite antibody. This is looking for a target called STEEP1, which is a different prostate cancer protein. So we wanna make sure we don't get too uh, focused on only PSMA. Uh, there are some patients who don't express PSMA. We learned that you know, for the vision trial where they did the PET scans and you had to have PSMA to get in, not everyone had. Um, so it is important to be developing other targets. And um, you know, I think it'll be very interesting to see how the drugs end up uh, comparing in terms of both efficacy and toxicity. But the AMG 509 is dosed every week. Um, and we've, we've been happy to participate in both trials. We've seen um, some good benefit to patients. Um, and actually I can share with you some results because they were presented at ESMO last year. Um, the initial experience with the dose escalation of the AMG 160 starting at this very low dose 0 0.003 milligrams and going up to what was a very high dose, 0.9 milligrams, um, where we did see a bit too much toxicity. Um, so um, this 0.3 milligram dose has um, expanded, uh, kind of a, striking a good balance between response and side effects. So what are we looking at here in these graphs? This is a waterfall graph on the top um, where everyone starts in that middle line. If your bar goes up, your cancer is growing. If your bar goes down, your cancer is shrinking or being killed or responding. Um, and so we can see that there are a lot of patients whose bars are going down, meaning they are benefiting from treatment. So we're seeing PSA reductions. Um, and this is really encouraging, especially in a phase one where we've looked at really low doses and really high doses. Um, before we even get to an optimal dose, we're clearly seeing that this can be effective. This bottom graph on the right is what we call a swimmer's plot. So it's a different way of looking at how patients on the study do. Each bar is again one patient, but here we're seeing how long are they on the study? How long are they benefiting? And this dotted line is six months. So I think most prostate cancer patients, if they are interested to learn how long does this treatment usually work, I think six months is a good amount. And so you can see that some of these patients did continue to benefit, continued on treatment beyond six months. So the AMG160 is moving ahead. I think we've been very happy with what we're seeing in responses. There are side effects. Almost most of my patients got a cytokine release, but it's very, very predictable. We know when it'll happen. We know what it'll look like, and we know how to uh, help alleviate the symptoms, those fevers and chills and that sort of thing. Um, so that patients, by the time they're uh, going home, so a lot of our early patients in the study stayed in the hospital for a couple days, three days, 
um, various amounts of time in various phases of the study. And but by the time they went home, they felt fine. And usually we didn't see side effects popping up in between doses. And interestingly, it gets better. The more doses you have, you seem to have less of this cytokine release. So although there is this toxicity, it's uh, been very predictable in how it will behave and how it can be managed. Um, and there have been some strategies that have been implemented to reduce the severity of the fever and chills. Um, some of those are listed in the box below. So T-cell therapy for prostate cancer, we are very excited that we're seeing preliminary efficacy. Um, we know that there are some good responses with PSMA targeting. Um, durability of treatment responses is something we're really looking at because, you know, patients go through some risk, uh, some hospitalization in the case of CAR T, you know, so they're sacrificing a bit. And so we want them to get a big gain from it. Um, and that's what we're working towards. You know, ideally, if we can get this to work right, it's a durable remission. It's not a temporary treatment. Um, there are some serious side effects, but they are ones that we know about. We know how to manage them. And so these agents should be able to be safely administered. With PSMA, you do get dry mouth. So you get it with the lutetium PSMA because PSMA is expressed in the salivary glands. And you can see that with um, the bite antibody to PSMA as well. Um, from our own experience at City of Hope with our CAR-T, PSCA does look like an active target. We've seen cancer response, but we do have this cystitis problem. Not everyone gets it, so it's a total mystery why some get it and why some don't. Um, and, but we're definitely focusing a lot on trying to mitigate that um, so that we can either escalate our dose or give multiple doses and try to get people to that durable remission. We may end up needing to add additional treatments. And then there's this problem where sometimes prostate cancer evolves or de-differentiates into neuroendocrine um, type cancer. We see that not just with CAR-T, we see that even after drugs like Zytiga or Xtandi, um, or Taxotere, right? So it's a problem we know of, but we're getting the sense in this particular patient population who's been through a lot of treatment that we're seeing on these studies, that maybe sometimes there is heterogeneity. There is a neuroendocrine and a regular prostate cancer. And if we're only focusing on one target, then we may not get the whole cancer. So there's all kinds of cool things coming down the pipeline with our scientists to target two different targets. So maybe you could get that neuroendocrine population and the regular one. Um, and a lot of other stuff that'll sound like science fiction if I talk about it, but um, it's not a deal breaker. It's just something that we're noticing and um, focusing on as we try to get patients to big response slash cure. There are some other less dramatic immunotherapies that you've probably heard about, and I just want to spend a few minutes on those. So you've probably heard of Cipulucil T or Provenj. And that's acting on the dendritic cell. So this brown thing in the middle, which is not labeled actually, is a dendritic cell. So it is like a teacher of the other immune cells. So when we give Cipulucil T, we're trying to get the dendritic cells to show the T cells, hey, if you see prostate cancer, it's something that we don't want and that you should go after. Uh, but that's why it takes a little more time because it's not hundreds of millions of cells that are ready to look for the cancer that go in it's these teachers and they have to go about the body and encounter T cells and teach them. Then you've probably also heard about immune checkpoint inhibitors. These have been breakthrough. The Nobel Prize was awarded um, to Dr. Allison among others who developed, understood the PDL1, PD1 checkpoint and the CTLA4 checkpoint. And that's led to drugs like pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, so Keytruda, Tocentric, Optivo. You've probably heard TV commercials about these, very, very successful in other cancers, unfortunately less successful in prostate cancer. So that's working on the tumor cell interaction with um, T cells or dendritic cells, um, primarily T cells where the tumor is telling the T cell, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm okay, you don't need to attack me even though the T cell might want to attack. So Cipulucil T is still around, but we would love for it to lead to bigger responses in more patients, right? It prolongs survival, very important. We'd love to see it really shrink cancer in the short term. 
And this was a very interesting abstract from last year, combining it with radium-223, which is also an FDA-approved drug for prostate cancer. And what they saw, first of all, was a dramatic increase in the time that it took for the cancer to grow, what we call time to progression. Nine months versus three, that's a pretty big difference. Um, and then on the waterfall plot, they actually did see some cancer shrinking. This isn't the most impressive waterfall plot, but when you think about CYP-T and radium-223, you don't usually see that. So that was pretty exciting as well. Um, so maybe more to come on that kind of a combination. In terms of the checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab, uh, which is also known as Keytruda. So we know that it works really for like 5% of prostate cancer if you don't select, but we have a selection factor, which is MSI, microsatellite instability, that you can get off of genomics. So when your doctor sends off for DNA sequencing, that's one of the things they're looking for is MSI. It's only in 3% of prostate cancers. You feel like you won the lottery when you find it in your prostate cancer patients because that seems to increase the likelihood of benefit from one of these easy, wonderful drugs from about 5% to maybe 50%. We don't really have great numbers. This was one very small study that was published in JAMA Oncology. You can see there are some patients who don't respond, um, but there are some with ongoing response. Um, this is out past a year. Here's the 50 week line. So some nice longer lasting remissions, but definitely not everyone obtaining that. So how can we make those checkpoint inhibitors work better? So there's been combination studies of ipilimumab and nivolumab. This was published by Pam Sharma. Um, not um, everyone benefits clearly and not all the patients could even get all four doses. They saw a lot of toxicity with this combination. So this is something I don't throw around lightly. I know some physicians out there are using ipinevo for prostate, but um, I have a little bit of concern that um, although some patients definitely benefit, a majority don't, and then there's that potential for significant toxicity, which is autoimmune toxicity. Uh, there are some predictive factors that might help us choose patients who might have a greater chance of benefit that might offset that risk. Um, so one of those was tumor mutational burden and another one was DNA repair alteration. And then another way to increase the activity of the immune checkpoint inhibitors um, is modulating the tumor microenvironment and the immune system in a way that predisposes to response. And that's something that this pill, cabozantinib, has been shown to do. Um, so cabozantinib actually went all the way to phase three uh, for prostate cancer because it can work for prostate cancer by itself, but it didn't quite make the, the mark, even though we all had patients who benefited from it clearly. So this combination has been really exciting because um, each drug on its own can work, but not quite for as many patients as we'd like, but together, um, you can see in this waterfall plot, really a lot of patients benefiting. The side effect profile is, you know, not insignificant. It's a pill you take every day that can cause everyday symptoms like nausea or diarrhea, um, loss of appetite, um, fatigue. So, but those can be modified, you know, pill therapies that have these kinds of side effects. We can lower doses, we can skip doses. So there's usually ways to make them livable. Um, so I would say, uh, Altogether, um, this combination is pretty exciting because a really uh, robust number of patients respond and there aren't um, quite as many really severe toxicities as some of the other things we've talked about. So this is in a phase three trial right now. So we were on this um, phase 1B that was presented last year and we're participating in the phase three. Um, so this is something that could be interesting. You do have to have soft tissue disease. It's not for patients whose cancer is only spread to the bone, which is unfortunate because that describes a lot of prostate cancer patients who cannot participate or benefit. Um, but I think this is one that might make it all the way into routine practice. So all in all, I'm so grateful to my uh, team, my mentors, Dr. Priceman and Dr. Foreman, um, and also patients, uh, not only are they participating in the study, um, but they're also supporting additional CAR-T study, which just really speaks to the excitement that there is around this um, therapeutic, and then just this whole team that supports all the work we do, including our collaborations with UCLA and USC. So with that, I will look forward to the Q&A.